Hello to everyone around the world watching from home, school, or work. I'm thrilled you could join us today for such a critical and timely discussion on an issue of great importance to me, my mother, my father, and the Clinton Foundation, the current state of global education for girls. Our conversation today is part of the Clinton Foundation's initiative, No Ceilings, the Full Participation Project, which seeks to advance the full participation of women and girls here in the United States and around the world. In February, as part of the No Ceilings initiative, we announced a new partnership with the Gates Foundation to gather and analyze what we believe will be the most comprehensive set of data ever to identify the progress that has been made from 1995 until 2015 in the advancement of rights and opportunities for women and girls and where gaps still unfortunately persist, whether in political, civil, economic, social, or cultural life. We know progress has been made. Indeed, many nations have enacted public policies to promote full equality. Yet for all this progress, women and girls still comprise the majority of the world's unhealthy, unfed, and unpaid. And hard-won rights and legal protections remain all too elusive in too many places. Specifically on education, our topic for today, studies have shown that educating girls leads to more prosperous, more stable, and healthier communities. Yet girls around the world are being targeted simply because they're exercising their basic right to seek an education. Even as many of us, including me, have been fortunate enough to attend school and receive an education, we are all too familiar with the stories of those who haven't. From the recent kidnappings in Nigeria to the story of Malala in Pakistan. Sadly, these aren't isolated incidences. Over the past 20 years, there has been striking progress in getting girls into primary school. Yet millions of girls still remain out of school and are expected never to enter. 31 million girls of primary school age remained out of school in 2011. 55% are expected never to enroll. Globally, there are 37.2 million girls not enrolled in secondary school. And while there are also 34.2 million boy, boys not enrolled in secondary school, that's a gap of more than 3 million. It's unacceptable for boys, it's unacceptable for girls. But attending school isn't enough. Girls also must learn basic knowledge and skills while there. In Nigeria, for example, only 2% of poor young women in the Northwest can read, compared with 97% of rich young women in the Southeast. In over 30 countries, over half of adolescents aged 15 to 19 lack basic foundational skills. Yet in 2013, 35% of employers around the world reported having difficulty finding talented people to fill the jobs they had open. Even in areas where girls receive an education, they have a harder time moving from school into the labor force. In Arab countries, for example, girls are more likely to make the transition into secondary school and outperform boys, yet only 18% of working age women are employed. Around the world, girls continue to face barriers that inhibit their ability to access an education and achieve a real education even while in school. From the practice of child marriage, concerns about safety and gender-based violence, the lack of latrines in schools, all of these are very real barriers to the full participation of girls in their own education. Adding to this problem, school-related violence can occur against children in, around, or on their way to and from school, undermining the impact of educational opportunities. These attacks include school bombings, abductions, imprisonment, torture, sexual violence, and even murder. We don't even really know the full extent of this challenge. Somewhere between 500 million and 1.5 billion children every year experience violence, many within schools. Clearly, we all need to do more work to ensure every girl can receive a quality and a safe education. That's what we're going to talk about here today. This is the second No Ceilings conversation. Last month, my mom and I sat down with the extraordinary America Ferreira for the first of these conversations on the status of girls and women in the world. And today I'm thrilled to be joined by Rebecca Winthrop, Director of the Center for Universal Education at the Brookings Institution in Washington, and Kennedy Odede, founder of Shining Hope for Communities in Kibera in Kenya. Today, with Rebecca and Kennedy, we will address the gains that have been made around the world in girls' education, 
and also the gaps that continue to persist for far too many in far too many places. We hope that all of you will submit questions via Twitter, Google Hangout, or email for Rebecca, Kennedy, and me. And while we're waiting for you to do so, I'd like to start with some of my own to help get the conversation going, although I hope that these are the last of the questions that I will ask myself. So first, turning to Rebecca. Rebecca, this is your life's work. This is what you focus on. This is what you think about. This is what you've traveled the world to see firsthand. In your experience, what are some of the greatest gains that we've made in girls' education? And what are some of the most persistent, insidious gaps that continue? Thanks, Chelsea, and, and thanks for having us on. And thank you very much for hosting this conversation. It's really um, an important topic. Um, and I think the, the first point about gains is really, really important for us all to focus on for a moment before we turn to gaps. Because girls' education has actually been an area where we've done really well, where we've been able to show that if everybody sort of bands together around a couple of clear goals and measures progress, we can actually make progress. And we've made huge progress on a slice of girls' education, which is primary education, and really getting an equal number of girls and boys in school. That's been a big project over the last 20 years from a number of us in the women's movement and the global education movement. Um, and to me, that just is hopeful, and it means progress is possible. Uh, and what I think we need to do now is probably focus on four, four big things, and you hit on, uh, hit on them all um, when you introduce the topic. Uh, one, the four, and then I'll just state a, you know, a little flavor really briefly, four is um, making sure that we expand access, not just at primary level, but early childhood as well as secondary. Um, a note on early childhood, people don't focus on it a ton, although actually your mom does a huge amount in early childhood. Um, but it is one of the most important ways in which we can get girls and boys, but particularly girls who often get a late start into school, um, on the right path. And only 15% of young people, young, girl, young kids around the world in developing countries have access to quality early childhood. So, Expanding access, the bookends of primary. The second is around quality. Um, we have learned lessons. I've been part of that. We've been pushed and pushed for access to school at, uh, at primary level, and governments around the world made school free. They built schools. They made them compulsory. Donors you know, put money into getting kids into school. And we didn't focus equally on making sure it was quality, quality teaching, quality materials. Um, and as a result, a lot of kids are in school and aren't learning very much. Uh, and, and hence they'll drop off, but it doesn't serve them well at all. There's 250 million kids around the world um, who most of them have been in school for four years who can't even read. Um, and I just think about my own kids. If he's in fourth grade and still can't read, you know how tragic that is. The third one is safety. Uh, and and you, you hit the nail on the head. It's two things for safety. It's a tax on schools, like we've seen um, in Nigeria. Um, and there's about 30 countries in the world where education is persistently attacked, teachers, buildings, students. Uh, and it's also about violence within schools. That happens to girls and boys, but girls are, are, are especially vulnerable. Um, and strategies to try to address that is important. And the last is, um, and this is, I think, an issue that we will be talking about much more in decades to come, hopefully not decades, but uh, I see it as sort of a longer tail issue is transition, successful transition to the world of work um, and, and preparing young girls in particular to do that. So those would be the big four things that, that I see as I sit and do all the research and policy advising on global ed education issues that we do here at Brookings. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. You know, Kennedy, some of what Rebecca just talked about, you're highly focused on in Shining Hope for Communities broadly and specifically in the Cabrera School for Girls. I know you're focused not only on ensuring that they get a quality education while they're within your walls, but also that they're safe coming to and from school. Can you talk a little bit about the school itself and also what you're doing to directly address some of the challenges that Rebecca talked about? Yes, I agree with I agree with Rebecca very well on that. Yeah, there's a lot of challenges that we are facing, but at the same time we have to accept that we have made a big impact so far. A lot to be done on girls' education, 
but so far we've done good. So what I think is an issue we have to create what's called the ecosystem. Safety is a big issue for girls in developing countries mostly. And what we did there in Kibera School for Girls was how do we able to buy men in the community in? By doing that, we were not able only to provide education for girls, but having an ecosystem whereby there is water, there is clinic, and I have to make sure that men understand the value of women education. You know what I mean? Because it's something that it can be culturally, but honestly, I believe it's much more into economical situation. It's economic because that you can see every parent want to have the best for their daughter, for their boy. You know what I mean? But they tend to think that <laughs> for boys is only financial impact, and whereby for for for, for the girls is about marriage. You know, that's what they think. So how do we change that, that 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 narrative? You know, that's whereby we have a school for girls connected to other social services. So we have a health clinic, we have a library that also kind of provides services to the men. And that somehow provides safety. You know what I mean? So that becomes the core value of that. Yeah. And you know, I think that's such a terrific point, Kennedy. So often kind of men and boys are not part of this conversation. Um, and I certainly couldn't imagine, you know, not having had my father be so encouraging of my own education when I was growing up. Um, you know, Rebecca Kennedy talked about what he's done through Shining Hope for Communities to enfranchise men, fathers, other men in the communities into ensuring that they understand it's in their best interest to educate their daughters, that it's not only about ensuring their daughters can make a good marriage. Um, what other strategies, Rebecca, have you seen to be successful in ensuring that men and boys in communities know that ultimately if girls are educated, they'll be better off too? Um, I think Kennedy's work is great, and, and I'd love to um, ask him, I will answer your question, I promise, but I'd love to, to ask him um, about what were, the, what were the initial reactions he got when he started reaching out to, to men who were maybe not initially supportive, and how did he overcome them? Because I feel like um, that's one of the strategies, is to be persistent. To be persistent, don't really don't take no for an answer, um, but don't be too pushy. I'm, I'm pushy as in sort of, I know best, you don't know best. That, that doesn't work. And I'm thinking of a lot of communities I've worked in around the world, and I have to say, people often ask that question of how, you know, if you have an environment where girls are not valued, how can you promote girls' education? And I have never been in a community where you haven't found somebody who values girls' education. And, you know, whether it's the Taliban in Afghanistan, there were male leaders who I remember we worked with who valued girls' education, helped do clandestine girls' school, whether it was in some of the very um, re girls' restrictive areas of South Sudan. There were women and men who quietly, quietly um, were supporting their girls. So um, amplifying those voices, giving them networks of support in a way that isn't... Um, too, too bold and gets them in trouble. You, ha you might have to go slowly at their own pace. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of a colleague I, I have in northern Pakistan, um, and he uh, was with us on, uh, we have a great sort of program with a wonderful partner called Echidna Giving that sponsors and supports emerging leaders in girls' education, heavily women but also men. And they, co they come to Brookings, there's lots of sort of training and get support when they go back. And he just visited us um, uh, last week and he said, you know, I went back, I was jazzed, and he got a huge amount of pushback from a, a group within his community. There were billboards along the, uh, you know, sort of when he came back home along on the road threatening him. So he said, you know, listen, I didn't take no, I went really slowly, I dialed down my expectations and started building very quiet support. So um, th those are examples that I, I've seen. Kennedy, um, would you answer Rebecca's question as to yes. sort of how you approach this, but also particularly you as a man? I mean, do you think that you were able to have in some ways more credibility making this argument? No, so what, what happened is that, as Rebecca said, there's a, there was a lot of resistance, for sure. So because it was the first girls' school in the slum, and as you know, men were not really happy with that. So what happened, I've seen happening is that you have to go slowly, as Rebecca said, but at the same time, there's something we call incentive. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So what are these men getting? Because at the long last, what I believe in is to change their perception on how they view women. That's, you know? So by doing that, I have to also call the incentive. So this is whereby 
men if they are sick, they have to come for the clinic. But they have to know that the clinic is provided by the Kibera School for Girls. <laughs> so if you burn down Kibera School for Girls, okay, you are burning down also your, the clinic, the water, the library. If you come to Kibera now, where I come from, you will see men are coming to read the newspaper. They love seeing the reading the newspaper. They love coming to the library. But in their mind, back of their mind, they know that this is true. Kibera School for Girls. So I think what you have to do much is more about initiative. How do we able to attract these men? How do we able to change their perception? You know what I mean? So because they really, they really don't get it, and you have to go slowly. So that's why. Okay, listen. We want to have a school for girls, but not only school for girls. We're gonna have a clean water in the center, you know what I mean? So that really changes the perception, you know, and I had to talk to the local leaders, you know, which are mostly men, you know what I mean? And that they felt they're benefiting directly. Okay, we're going to have a school for girls, we're going to have water, we're going to have the clinic, we are in for that, you know? So, uh, and at the beginning was a really a lot, a lot of a lot of resistance, but incentive really worked out. <laughs> um, well, Clearly, Kennedy, it's worked out. I've been lucky enough to be with you in Kibera and have seen uh, men reading the newspapers. I've also seen men proudly walking their daughters to school. So yeah. I think you can see your success in so many different ways on just a day-to-day -day basis. You know, Rebecca, um, kind of bridging off of what Kennedy just said about water, um, how critical do you think it is to ensure that water, but also sanitation and hygiene, um, are part of improving just the state broadly for girls' education around the world. And do you see the linkages that Kennedy has made so clearly in Kibera starting to be made more commonly elsewhere, or is Kennedy still just very much kind of a lonely visionary? Um, I think it's crucial. Uh, it's absolutely crucial. Water, sanitation, health care, and, and uh, livelihoods training, there's a whole suite of supports um, that girls, any person needs in order to achieve, and girls are no different, although they have particular barriers, and so their, in, their interventions um, need particular supports. Um, the, the problem is, um, you know, if you talk to any girl, she, she's like, you, you know, she's one girl, she wants to be educated, she, you know, wants to have a family, she needs she needs food, she needs water, you know, she needs proper um, sanitation facilities. Uh, you know, the problem is in programming, in interventions, we've become very bureaucratic. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's very sort of specialists, you know, for one piece of what a girl needs. Um, and that's not bad to have specialists in those areas. The problem is bringing them all together collectively in one place for one girl, which is basically what Kennedy is doing. And lots of programs are, are doing that. It's not new at all to talk about the multi-sectoral approach. Um, but I have to say, it, it often ends up being much more um, in the discourse, in the language, in the way we talk about things. And it, there's all sorts of bureaucratic hang-ups when it comes to actually doing it on the ground. So Kennedy is not alone. There's lots of groups around there. And I would say it's groups who take a community-based approach to programming that really are on the forefront. That was a great question from Nicole Ritter. Um, Kennedy, sort of, you know, segueing from what Rebecca was just talking about, you know, do you see more of this holistic approach in Kenya and in other developing countries where now you're being asked to share your experience? Do you think kind of the bringing together of the different silos that Rebecca talked about is starting to be more the norm when thinking about education yeah. broadly and specifically for girls? With you, Chelsea, it's been really hard, to be honest. People are not really into that so far. Because people just think that for girls is water. You know what I mean? It's education. You know I mean? And everything I'm doing so far is about personal experience, you know, growing up in Islam, you know, and seeing whatever my mother was passing through as a as a, as a, as a, as a woman. That's really inspired me to do this, you know. And I felt that these things are really integrated, you know what I mean? So so far, uh, most of the time people are trying to go one way. Which is okay, as Rebecca said. But it's not really working well in places like Kibera, in Islam, you know, because it's much more, it's more than education, you know, we are providing the quality of education, you know, for example, we have a library, so when the girls are coming from school, they are able to go and read, there's, a, there's, there's light for them to read, you know, at the same time, water, you know what happened, most of the time, sexual abuse happened during when the, the, the girls are going to fetch the water, you know what I mean, 
So by bringing these things closer, it also gives them safety. You know what I mean? But I would like to tell the, the world to start focusing on this ecosystem, on this holistic approach. You know, because so far, even the foundations are not really ready for that. They are like, it's a school, it's a school. You know, it's water, it's water. You know? And as Rebecca said, I would really be happy if more people can be really more involved. And as I said before, this is much more community-based approach. You know what I mean? It's much more grassroots. Yeah. Kennedy, you know, Nia Jackson just sent us a question that is a good continuation of that. You know, first, Rebecca, um, given that so many girls are the most vulnerable while they're in transition, transition to school, transition, as Kennedy was just saying, to collect water, transition to collect firewood, um, what have you seen to be successful strategies from governments to ensure that girls are safe while going to and from school? Um, there is a lot of different things that governments can do depending on the context in which the girl is um, living. Uh, and it, you know, some places girls are incredibly unsafe because it's an insecure environment. There's armed conflict, there's instability. I remember um, very successful programs escorting girls and boys within Kosovo sort of during and after the war, you had UN, um, UN peacekeeping troops would escort kids to and from school. Um, I remember similar strategies to going to and from school with, they weren't UN peacekeeping forces, but they were community mobilized um, safety patrols who would, es in Liberia, would escort girls because girls were vulnerable to attack to and from, they would have to go long distances and parents were rightly very worried about sending their girls to school. They felt their boys could handle it. Um, it could run faster or would be so susceptible. Um, but it was also a way to get girls into school, to have these parental community escorts. Um, so that's one really important piece. And there's other things on a policy level that governments can do. Um, there's a great organization that I was happy to be, you know, help in the formation of early on called the Global Coalition to the for protection of education under attack. It's a terrible acronym, but it's basically about keeping education safe. Um, and one of their, they look at both this community level prevention piece, but also another piece that governments could really sign up to um, is trying to make schools safe zones. Um, you know, in, in secure environments, in armed conflict, the, the, there's a, you know, a cross that goes above a health clinic and militaries, military, you know, if they, not everyone, of course, but don't use the health clinic for um, military operations. Don't you know hang out there to you know as a base, but they do for schools. And there's no sort of symbol to protect schools um, the same way in those contexts. And that's something that is very ripe for governments to take action on right now. And you see more governments doing that. I have seen a growing interest. Um, the, there is a brand new sort of uh, set of guidelines on how um, militaries, uh, military armed forces around the world should um, keep schools as safe zones. Um, and there's a beginning movement, but this, this group, this coalition is really going to be coming out in the next several months with trying to get governments to come on board. So that would be a great thing to support if, if any, of your, any of the people participating in, in the conversation today, care about it, and I'll, I'll be happy to po post information on this on this network on Twitter, the sort of at Rebecca Winthrop. I'll do that after if people want to want to join in. Great, thank you, Rebecca. Um, you know, Kennedy, what have you seen in Kenya as some of the efforts to ensure that girls are kept safe? I mean, not only in your community of Kibera, but do you see the Kenyan government making this more of a priority? Yes, uh, I see that uh, in the Kenyan government, there are really um, much has to be done. But so far, for example, sanitary travels, they have been working on how to ensure that every every girl in, in Kenya is able to have a sanitary towel. You know what I mean? But things are really much more working. But in terms of the safety for, for, for girls, I think it's much more is happening in the communities, mobilization, you know, because I think that's the only way, way, way forward, starting from the grassroots level, you know. And the government can just provide the policies and and support on that, yeah. And as you know, we have now right now we have a new government that has been really talking much that they want to empower more women, and so that looks like a great sign. And also the number of women in in, in the parliament, you know, that really gives me a lot of hope. You know, I remember recently there was a there was a vote in parliament 
uh, that was allowing men to have two wives. And I saw women parliamentarians were against it, you know what I mean? And it raised a lot of talk in the country. So I can say that Kenya is heading towards the right direction. I think, you know, Kennedy, even in this country, we were very impressed by, certainly I was very impressed by how um, strong and stalwart the women parliamentarians and their and their few male supporters were in opposing the polygamous legislation in yeah, the yeah. <laughs> So I think um, your admiration is is more broadly shared than maybe you otherwise would have known. Um, this is a great question from from Mohammed. How can we inform illiterate parents about the importance of education to girls? You know, Rebecca Kennedy. Rebecca, why don't you go first and then and then Kennedy you can answer after Rebecca. Um, it's a great, it's a great question, um, and the things that I've seen, uh, which to me says um, there's absolutely a way to reach parents who haven't had a chance to be educated themselves, or even if not going through school, even learn to read or write, um, is that when kids, and it all depends on young kids, um, actually having a quality learning experience. You can get them into school and if they don't learn to sort of read and write in the first couple of years, parents will, who particularly parents who are illiterate, will pull them. But the case they say, well, you're not, you spent all this time and it's, you know, it's an opportunity cost for them and the family and you're not gaining anything from it. Oh, it's amazing. I've seen it in country after country. When um, young kids can come back and help parents read a medicine bottle, they can take them to the health clinic and help them navigate um, uh, clinic procedures. They can help them read road signs. They can help them, tr you know, work on government documents. Um, they become incredibly valuable, and those parents I certainly have seen are huge advocates for education because all of us being illiterate is so difficult. It closes your world. I mean, can you imagine if you were walking around your town and you couldn't read anything? Like it's incredibly oppressive. And so when these young kids can actually learn to read and write, parents are, are, are incredibly supportive. Um, so that, that to me it says why you know quality is so important too, because you don't have 10 years to learn to read and write. They're not going to give them that long. They're going to give them a, a couple of years. Yeah. I don't know Kennedy, Kennedy. different experience. Yeah, so that's good. So you know I've been really much more personal, you know what I mean? Yeah. And how do you, for, okay the first thing to understand is that try to be be able like a literate person too, you know, for this uh, for the parents, you know. For example, everybody wants the better for their kids. And let's agree on that. Everyone wants the better for their daughter and for their boys. And they think, let's be honest here, they think that by marrying <laughs> their daughters, they're giving them a better life. And by investing on men's education, on boys' education, they are giving them a better life. Are we together on that? So how do you go about that? So this is what we say. How many cows do you get? You know what I mean? Not much. What do you want? Everybody wants a better house, you know what I mean? A better life. Listen, if you educate your daughter, <laughs> look at Swans, look at Wangari Madai, for example, you know, that's in Kenya. You no, know, you get these kind of names, and this mother or this woman will be like, or this parent will be like, wow, I get it. You know what I mean? Look at the life people are living now here. Look at so and so. You know what I mean? By giving education to a girl, you are also giving to the community. You know I mean? It's a big investment. And you make it much more personal in communities, it really has a big impact, you know. So I always do that in Kibera by talking to the parents. They have a dream. You know what I mean? For example, in the slum of Kibera, we live in a tiny room, you know, there's no food, there is no water, you know. But if you educate your daughter, you are opening opportunities for your daughter and for you, you know, and to the entire community. And that really sells so fast, you know. Because what has happened, people have been like, by educating, uh, you know, by giving your daughter education, you know, she's going to have a better life, you know. But nobody brings it practical. So what I've learned is that how to bring it practical to the parents who are illiterate. And they'll get it. As, and the, and the, this, is the, this is the answer. Let's all believe that everybody wants the best for their kids. So again, taking the conversation out of the rhetorical and making it really practical for yeah. parents <laughs> and for families. Yeah. Um, this is a question from Aaron Matson. What role do menstruation taboos play in hampering access to education, and what is being done to address that? Rebecca, why don't you start, and then Kennedy, I know you generally work with younger girls still at the Cabrera School, but I know this is something you've thought about as well, so 
Rebecca and then Kennedy? Um, it's a really, really good question. Um, and to be honest, the evidence, I'm using my Brookings researcher hat now, the evidence is actually kind of mixed. Some say it does, does cause a big problem. Some say actually it's not a huge problem as we might think. Um, and is that, Rebecca, is that evidence mixed because different countries have different experiences, different realities prevail in different communities, or is it just that the research isn't clear? The research isn't totally clear. I, most people, if you talk to, to, to sort of hardcore researchers, would say um, actually menstruation doesn't pose a huge problem for girls' success, which is, surpri which is surprising, particularly to women and young girls who you talk to. They say, are you kidding me? It does to me. So um, that's why I kind of say it's, it's mixed. I, I don't think we're totally there yet um, in terms of the research base. But, you know, it's very clear, and this gets back to our safety and security question that we talked about before, um, that if you don't have sex segregated latrines and latrines where um, there is water so girls can clean themselves and wash up in schools, girls are going to miss school when they get, when they start menstruating, when they, when they enter that really tricky um, period after primary school when many of them begin to drop off. Um, and it's hard to say, oh, it's because uh, they're, they're menstruating um, and they don't have the right facilities or the right sanitary pads, etc., um, to be able to let them go to school during those, during those um, days, or if it's that combined with many other things. Um, such as uh, pressure to marry or the quality has been low and they haven't been able to keep up on their studies and then they are kind of pushed out out of school um, and and take up you know work so um, that that's what's hard to say but clearly we know that programming um, for girls around latrines around sanitary napkins is cannot be but helpful because they're missing, you know, chunks of time each month um, if they don't have that. And we certainly know that if you miss a, a lot of school, it's very hard to keep up. And for, and for girls in particular, it goes for boys too, but for girls in particular, once they drop out and are, or miss a big chunk of school, they're likely never to come back again, particularly at the sort of middle school, secondary uh, school level. So it's a really crucial transition point for girls. And, and Kennedy, within Shining Hope for Communities, how do you tackle this question of, of menstruation taboos? That's good. Yeah, so what we do is what we call in the town halls meeting. We are able to involve the parents and teachers, and also having a counselor who can able to work with the girls, you know, because most of the time it's, and then other things that we are integrated, you know, that really helps a lot. We have the clinic. Uh, we have the water, we have the, the, the toilets, and we, we have everything around the school, you know. And it's also about education, you know. Sometimes we have this girls with their first time, you know, and I think it's really good also to engage them with their counselor, which is at the school, you know. Yeah, and it's been, we have been really, we never lost anybody from the school because of that, because of, that's because of what we have at, at the center, you know. And, and Kennedy, how can you have conversations even about taboos like menstruation with the parents or the broader members of the community? Is that easier now than it was when you started? That's, it's still a little bit, uh, you know, as you know, in Africa. But we are able to engage this thing with the women, you know, women at the school. It, it, would, it would be hard in the United States, too, to be clear. <laughs> hard in the United States. We have lots of yeah. challenging conversations in our own country about everything related to sort of sexual health education. So this is not just about Africa or Kenya or Kibera. And So what, what I try to do is to be like a role model for men, you know, to be involved, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's to be involved with this, uh, into these issues because it's been a taboo for men to talk about it, you know I mean? But as a leader in the community, I come out so strongly and working with the women, you know, in the community who are really able to, to help. And it's also, I like it when it becomes a discussion, you know what I mean? Because even, for example, it's so sad, listen to this. A poor girl in Kibera cannot talk about her period with her parents. You know what I mean? That's sad. So my work is to do how to start conversations, you know? And it became a really big issue. So what you have to do, you have to crack it by starting conversations with the fathers, with men, and the entire community. You know? and, the, and the school becomes the center of all those things to start. And the school then provides a safe place to have those conversations. Yes, yeah. And that's become... Well, one thing, Chelsea, sorry to just tag no, in please. here, and I'm sure that um, 
I'd be curious if Kennedy approaches it the same way, but one of the sort of successful programs I've seen on this is where you start a conversation, but you don't come out strong as, let's talk about menstruation, everybody, here we go, but talking about um, sort of initiation rights, womanhood, and in South Sudan there's a great program around comfort kits, they call them comfort kits, and it had a range of things for health, including a sanitary pad, but it was for many other things. Um, that you know, parents would want uh, their young girls to have. I don't know if that's part of the strategy that Kennedy uses or not. I, I agree with you, Rebecca. You know, you have to start it with a bigger picture, you know, and then you go there slowly. For example, I have a, a short story I share with you. So I was uh, having a problem in Kibera for saying that we should not beat our, our girls, you know, in, you know, and parents and community were like, "No, you are wrong. A kid must be beaten." You know what I did? So I called them and I said, listen, guys, let's talk about this. Today, we go back home. When one of your daughter does something wrong that you think you have to, treat her, you have to kind of punish, so can you try to, to deny your daughter what she likes? She likes to play? She likes to listen to radio? Or she likes to play with her friends? Put her in a corner. Let's see if it's going to work. So that was a homework in the community. <laughs> so two people said they were going to try it and bring back what happened to, 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 to the entire school. Chelsea was really amazing to see what happened. You know, they were like, wow, it worked. So I told them it's not about beating, you know, it's about, uh, you know, it's about denying the daughter what, that's a taboo, denying them what they used to enjoy more, you know, instead of just, uh, in terms of physically abusing them. And, you know, and that's what happened in the community. You know, I mean, if you tell them don't beat your kid, they're like, no, it's African culture, we have to punish the kids, you know. And as Rebecca said, slowly by slowly, you were like, guys, go try it at home. No pressure, and then bring back the report. So mm -hmm. when they, those few women brought the report back to the school in the community, other women were so happy to go and try it. You know what I mean? So I've learned on how, the, the, on how to engage the community. You know, actually, when it comes to taboo, you have to be more practical. You have to go slowly by slowly. More, more practical and also provide different models. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> um, pivoting um, to a different topic. Uh, Alison Cavanaugh asks, how can we leverage technology to improve girls' education globally? I want to add a uh, sort of addendum to that. What can technology help solve in this conversation about girls' education, and what can technology not help solve? Rebecca? I think that is a perfect addendum, Chelsea, because I um, fear that we get very excited with gadgets, gadgets and products and things that people can make which are really cool but might not really help the educational teaching and learning experience of young kids. Um, and I've seen lots of gadgets that are dusty and have, you know, uh, cloths over them in corners of schools who, you know, get distributed but aren't used. So to me the, real, the very first question you have to ask when you're talking about technology is what is the problem? Uh, and do you need tech? Are, can you solve it without technology? If you add technology, is it cheaper? Is it more reliable? Is it? Can you solve it better? Um, and if it's not, you should stick with uh, the normal way without technology. And the good thing is that there's an answer uh, yes to to the to the sets of problems that technology really can do much better. Um, one thing is reach, uh, reaching young people who really have a hard time um, accessing the educational ecosystem. Um, one of my uh, favorite examples is a mobile phone program with girls actually in Pakistan who because of insecurity were having a hard time regularly coming to school and certainly were totally um, very, very rural isolated, totally isolated in the summertime. No books, no, no uh, reading materials and one of the things we know in education is if you don't sustain the learning, you know you go to school, say you're in grade one, and then you go summer and you have no reinforcement, you have no books, your family is literate, and you come back to school in grade two, you've probably lost half, if not more, of the learning you gained that first year. So if you can find a way to sustain their learning over the summer, they'll, they'll drastically you know, be able to succeed much better over time. And so this mobile phone um, program gave cell phones to families, and, people, and it was to the girl only, the girl could use it. Um, and she uh, had lots of back and forth with teachers, and then they had little quizzes and questions and engagement, and could have, and it was a bit of a lifeline for them. Um, so that's a great 
problem around reach. Another problem that technology can absolutely help us solve, and it's it's not the, the one um, that is often thought about because it's not very sexy, but it's management. It's all what I would call the back office instead of the front office. All the stuff to do with how many kids are going to school? Are they dropping out? Where are your girls? What are their reading levels? Are our teachers showing up? All the basic information that a school head needs, a teacher needs, a minister of education needs that's so hard to collect with a paper and pencil system and people walking files, adding them up manually. So that's a, that's a really important area where technology could, could be a huge breakthrough. Um, and there, there's many others, of course. I'd, I'd love to hear Kennedy's favorites. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, Chelsea, what's happening is that it's so sad. You talk about the percentage of the employers looking for employees, you know, and they can't find any, especially for women. Let's think about, let's go back to the what happened in Nigeria, Chibok. Look at that school. Do they really have computers? No. That's sad. You can see. You know what I mean? So there's a lot to be done, and I think we should invest more into the STEM technology. You know, and that's how we're gonna have the more women in, in technology. You know, I mean, as you see, even in Africa now, technology is becoming a big issue. You have to understand it. You know, and many people have been denied. So look, if you talk about education uh, in Africa, uh, you can see there's less is happening about technology, and that's become a big issue. And but how can we use technology to help in education? What I think is that how to how to make it much more to connect. You know, I think there's something powerful when schools connect from Nigeria to Kenya, Kenya to the States, you know what I mean? And that way they can learn a lot from each other, you know what I mean? Yeah, but I would like to say that we should put more emphasis on the STEM technology because especially in, in Africa developing countries, we are really, really behind, you know, so much behind. Well, we're not investing enough in this country either, can we? <laughs> in STEM education, broadly or um, specifically for girls. You know, Rebecca, what have you seen, kind of leveraging off of Kennedy's question, as sort of successful strategies, if any, in encouraging um, girls' participation in STEM programs in the developing world? There's not a lot, first of all. Um, and I, I would totally second what Kennedy's saying, that this is an area that we need a lot more over the next probably five, seven, ten years around. Um, one of the things that I have seen, and this is a colleague, um, a friend, who was a part of this um, Echidna Scholars Program that, that, that we run with Echidna Giving, and she is an academic um, in Nigeria at a university, and she um, is a scientist, and her and she's one woman who works to train teachers on science education. And she says she's like the lonely woman who in both her colleagues are, are men. Um, and also to try to, she's been working for the last several years to try to get um, more female teachers interested to go into teaching sciences. And then she's sort of, as she's been uh, sort of researching this, she's realized that it, actually you need to get, um, get to the girls at middle school. Because that's when they, at primary school, they're probably, you know, equally interested, and that's when they start diverging. And you probably would know more, Chelsea, about U.S. education, but I feel like it's similar. Um, I, I, I don't know a ton, but... Yeah, it's, it's, it's exactly the same here. I mean, if you look at elementary school, um, girls are just as engaged, perform just as well, if not better, in science and math than boys do. Girls are just as likely, if not even more likely, than boys to say they want to be astronauts, engineers, scientists, biologists. And then there's a hemorrhage in middle school of performance, of interest, of engagement, and of candidly ambition. So right. we have exactly the same challenge that we're finally, thankfully, focused on here in the United States. And it's, that's fascinating, and I think she was looking at that a lot when she was here. And one of the things that she sort of landed upon as a strategy that she's been trying out um, is female teachers. And, you know, there's been some really recent d data um, around actually the pivotal, not to say every single woman is a great teacher, but for girls, having female teachers makes a huge difference. Um, and so female teachers in the sciences 
Um, and then she's trying all sorts of new pedagogical methods to teach science at high school level, middle school, high school level. So putting science in with storytelling and creative writing and, you know, the, the things that, that apparently girls in Nigeria are more prone to want to spend their time doing. Um, so those are some of the strategies that I, that I know that she, that Adafunke is doing. Um, I, I think that's so important because I think frequently it's just challenging for any of us, wherever we are in the world, to imagine ourselves as what we can't see. Mm -hmm. And so having female science teachers I think is critical. You know, also, Kennedy mentioned Wagari Matai, who is one of my personal heroes. Yeah. Elevating women who have been transformational leaders mm -hmm. as examples for girls and boys in school, I think, is tremendously important. So, Kennedy, how do you ensure that girls in the Cabrera School for Girls kind of know what powerful women look like and that they don't feel like that's unattainable for them, that they could also be a powerful change maker in their own right when they grow up. Yeah. So so far we we, we have figures like Wangari Madai, which is really amazing, and then we are teaching them history, which they love so much. At the same time, we talk, look at Africa now. We have uh, President Banda, you know, from Malawi. We have been seeing a lot of uh, African women coming up. Uh, well, Salif of President Salif of Liberia. You know what I mean. And we also have Kenyan women leaders, you know. So what we do, we're trying to bring mentorship, having the corporate women coming to Kibera to talk to our girls. In that way, they're able to inspire, you know, uh, to be inspired and bring start what's called uh, in, uh, mentorship programs, you know. So because when you are living in the slum of Kibera, really, you don't see what's happening outside. The world is enclosed, you know. So by bringing these people, it was amazing. Chelsea, they loved it when you came, you see. That mm -hmm. Really I, I loved coming, so hopefully you'll invite <laughs> me back, Kennedy. <laughs> yeah, but sorry, and Chelsea, another thing I wanted to talk with you and Rebecca, I don't know what you think about it, is in terms of girls' education, I've been really worried with the emphasis on the secondary education. And yet, most vulnerable girls don't really make it to secondary. So I don't see much happening. Is everything is about secondary school. So what do you guys think about this? Because I feel like if you see places like Ibera, it's so hard to make it secondary. Mm -hmm. That's why Kibera School for Girls take these needy kids from the beginning so we can be able to help them get into secondary. Because there are a lot of scholarships, a lot of support you know, into secondary, but there's no much happening for primary education. What's going on? <laughs> this goes to the quality question, yeah? I think, that Rebecca raised earlier. Rebecca, what do you see as some of the efforts to really improve the quality of primary education yes and not just focused on the quantity of space available in schools. Yeah. Oh gosh, that's such a large, big, important, difficult, difficult question. Um, it's one of the, the things that I've been focused myself personally on the last couple of years. Um, and there's all sorts of things you need to do to make the teaching and learning experience good and for kids to actually learn what they should be learning along the way. Um, and those probably vary by country because there's different gaps. You know, it's quality teachers, it's good instructional material, it's making sure you have attendance, it might be school feeding in certain places. Um, but one of the things that we've been really grappling with with many, many other partners is what should children learn? You know, are there are there core things that we think every kid should learn, no matter, you know, if they're in the Cabrera slum or they're, you know, in Anacostia here in Washington, D.C., or somewhere in, you know, the Brazil? You know, are there core things that we want all kids to learn? Of course, every country has its national curriculum, its national identity. It's very politically and culturally specific, but I think there are core things. And, and some of the things that we have been working on with a lot of partners um, in a group with this another terrible acronym and I will also post it on Twitter for people who are at, right after this for people who are interested called the Learning Metrics Task Force. Awful. But the point is can we get some agreement um, and there's been a groups from a hundred countries around the world thinking about what are the core things we want young people to learn. What do we even mean by when we say quality learning? Is it just reading? That's it? And you know this group has really looked at, at, at at a core group of things that is reading and math clearly, but also other things like problem solving and critical thinking and some social and emotional skills that we know are essential mm -hmm. um, for being creative innovators, creative collaborators, as you're 
dad actually talks about, I uh, heard him recently, that that type of skill set is going to be really important for solving the complex problems we have. Um, and so trying to, I think one of the strategies is trying to focus people on those core things that kids should learn along the way from early childhood through primary and then on to secondary. And then every country will have a diverse set of inputs and processes it needs to do to try to get those kids to learn those things. Um, but if we could focus on the outcomes, because a lot of time people talk about quality and they say, yes, I've had so many conversations with ministers, yes, quality is terrible. In fact, we have no roofs on our school, the kids get rained on. And they're right, that is poor quality. But you could have a roof and still they wouldn't be learning. So if we can focus on sort of core learning outcomes along the way um, that are common, I think we could make big progress. You know, I think that is tremendously important, um, kind of recognizing what could and maybe should be global and that what also must be and should be more nationally determined or locally denominated, um, whether here in the United States or in Kenya or around the world. Um, this is our last question, and I want to talk about something that's a more kind of current event that is really one of the reasons that we're having this conversation. Um, here this morning, um, at least here this morning on the East Coast of the United States, um, which is around the rise of hashtag activism. Um, you know, in Nigeria, I think we've all been just completely obsessed, kind of completely unable to turn away from kind of the ongoing tragedy of the kidnapped girls, and not only uh, what that must be meaning to their families, to their friends, to their communities. Um, but also the implications of such an extraordinary tragedy happening to girls anywhere in the world. And this hashtag activism that is expressed right now through the hashtag Bring Back Our Girls campaign um, has just continued to light across Twitter and other social media platforms um, and speaks to this larger trend of hashtag activism as a way to spread awareness. Um, how impactful do both of you think this type of online global activism is, either to raising awareness or to really focusing attention and action that will actually make a difference to preventing the next kidnapping, for example? Do you think it matters? that there is a global conversation on social media platforms, hashtag bring back our girls? Or do you think actually, as great as it is that the world is paying attention, it won't matter? Oh, okay. <laughs> so let me talk, okay, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit. Yeah, so let, let's go back to what happened in Nigeria. You can remember that it was not a big news in Nigeria for a while. Until two weeks, two weeks it took to so, really yeah. get <laughs> so, international attention. So we have to give credit to the hashtag that went viral, became a movement. You know what I mean? That that's why I love technology. You see, the power of technology that was able, the pressure was put to the government, and they took it serious. You know what I mean? So I have to say that it's much more. It will make it make the people to be accountable. You know what I mean? The government to be accountable security for, his, for, 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 for their people, you know what I mean? Because by the time that hashtag has been really much more powerful, a way of awareness, and it will make even other countries are now really worried on how to take care of their schools, of their guns, you know? So I have to say it was really something, uh, is, a, is a powerful tool, and it was able to put pressure, and right now we can see that pressure has forced the government to invite other, other people from other countries to come and help them, you know? So I think for me it was something positive, you know. Hashtag has been, you know, was so positive for for, for to help what happened. It's, it's much more. I have to say, it's much more about awareness. It's more okay. about awareness for you, Kennedy, because you think it actually encouraged the Nigerian government to take action when Which, otherwise it might not have. As you said, it took it took that time before them taking any action. You know what I mean? And uh, and yeah, and also you no, know, it also make me. I love this how the world is becoming global as a village. What's happening in Nigeria becomes an issue. Even to the, to the White House, I saw the first lady, uh, Michelle Obama, also has his own you know, hashtag, you know, and, and, and that movement was created. So I think it's making the world to be, a, to be a village, and that's very, very important. And Rebecca, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree with 
I agree with Kennedy, but I have some reservations. Um, I mean, I agree that actually, what are the good things? One is it brings people, particularly young people, and let's face it, if we don't bring young people into this movement for global education, for, for human rights, for women's rights, for girls' rights, we're not going to sustain the movement over time. So we need all of you guys uh, who are there listening in this conversation today and others who participated and are concerned and are shocked to come into the movement. So I think it's a great way to bring people into the issue. Um, the second thing I think is it's a great way to sort of shine some sunlight and spotlight on some really horrific things that, that, that happen and make governments uncomfortable and more accountable. We were, ha just like Kennedy said, we were having a, I was having a conversation with a colleague who's a girls education advocate in northern Nigeria, Judith Ann Walker is her name, she's fabulous and brave um, and has three girls of her own who she's had to pull out of school because the schools have collapsed. And she said, listen, this issue was going on well before the, ha she, she was talking about the hashtag act activism, she didn't use that term, well before the global spotlight, but it's been really helpful to make the government kind of embarrassed because they really didn't care much. That's her opinion. Uh, she lives in the north about northern Nigeria about what's happening to girls for some time. Um, and now it's, so that's useful, the sort of spotlight accountability. Um, she did say, you know, listen, I would hope that people don't just focus on the Chibuk girls, that they focus on the issue. She talked about the now the growing missing millions of girls in, in going to school because the schools are closing. Mm -hmm. um, and you know it's about bringing the girls back, absolutely, but now there's thousands upon thousands of girls who are out of school because many, many primary schools are closing in the area. So how do we, I guess my question really, and Chelsea, maybe you, have, you probably have some answers to this. You're, you're, you've are thought a lot about strategies for movements, I think. How do we sustain? How do we sustain the interest? How do we make sure that it isn't just you know once the girls are returned, people don't care about Northern Nigeria? Cross our fingers. Cross our fingers. Everybody knock on wood that the girls come back. Once they're back, it sort of evaporates. That's that. Eh, no more. Like how do we sustain the interest? For example, in Northern Nigeria for girls, which is an issue that's certainly going to go on for some time and has been going on for some time. Well, I think it's about candidly. Um, Rebecca, people like you, people like Kennedy who have real solutions to the different challenges we've talked about surrounding girls' education, ensuring that those solutions are well known so people who want to stay engaged, whether online or off, have places to point to, either to hold governments accountable or to hold aid agencies accountable or NGOs accountable to focusing on what works. And then it's also about ensuring that the same community that helped galvanize around hashtag bring back our girls can be galvanized if, God forbid, something like this happens again. And so I think it's about both of those, ensuring that people can focus on what works and put attention and pressure on what works um, for different organizations and governments, um, but also want to participate the next time we need a global community response to a local tragedy, but as Kennedy said, one that is occurring in our increasingly globalized village online and off. Um, I want to thank everyone who's joined us today um, from across the Google Hangout ecosystem, to use Kennedy's word. Um, I want to thank Google for hosting us today. I want to thank Rebecca and Kennedy for joining us today and even more for all the work that each of you do so tirelessly that is so important. Um, I want to encourage everyone who's joined us today to keep talking about this conversation, talking about these concerns, talking about solutions. And I hope that you'll continue to be part of our larger No Ceilings conversation. Um, immediately following this, we're going to launch a survey on the Clinton Foundation website, clintonfoundation.org backslash survey. We hope that you'll fill it out and tell us what you think about what's happened today, but also where you want the No Ceilings conversations to go over the next year. We are committed to having more convenings like this in different types of fora so that as many people in as many places can join our ongoing work and inform our work about what full participation for women and girls should look like in the 21st century. Um, but again, I just want to thank Rebecca and Kennedy. I hope that 
um, all of you who are inspired by their work, will support their work, will also help inform their work. Um, and I hope that this is not the last time that we'll have a chance to all talk together in whatever formats may emerge over the coming months. So thank you all again. Please stay tuned to the Clinton Foundation, to New Ceilings, to Rebecca and Kennedy, and onward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Kennedy. Bye, John.